What are some of the top Mafia myths of all time? Let's check it out. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organised crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. Today, we're going to take a quick look at a selection of myths associated with the American Mafia. Many books and documentaries often state that Charlie Luciano earned the nickname Lucky after he survived being taken for a ride and tortured in 1929. However, this is inaccurate. The day after Luciano was found left for dead on Highland Boulevard, Staten Island in 1929, several newspapers reported the incident. But interestingly, they all referenced that Charlie Luciano was already known by the alias Lucky. As seen in one such article as follows. Gangster, taken for a ride, lives to tell about it. Lucky Lucania, forced into a car, beaten and stabbed, and thrown out in Staten Island Road. Pal of Rothstein Bodyguard was quizzed in Hotsy Totsy Murders. Taken for a ride and living to tell of it, was the luck of Charles Lucania, known to the police as Lucky, 33, chauffeur and Broadway racketeer, who gave his address as 365 East 10th Street. A clear indication that Charlie Luciano was already known by the moniker Lucky prior to his kidnap and assault. Another clear example that Luciano was known by this name prior to 1929 is his arrest record. We can see here, even back in 1926, that Charlie Luciano was documented as having the alias Charlie Lucky. The arrest report reads, Charles Lucania, alias Charlie Lucky, 11 26 Assault and robbery. 11 26 Discharged. In 1960, Luciano himself would even state to Roderick Mann, that he received his nickname when he was in his youth. Luciano would state, Like how I came to be called Lucky. The papers always print that I got called that because I once walked back from a gang ride. Listen, nobody ever walked back from a gang ride. Those rides ended in the river. I got called Lucky when I was a kid, because my real name was Licania. See? Lucky Luciano to Roderick Mann, July 2nd, 1960. Most documentaries state that Bonanno crime family captain Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano was murdered because he had allowed undercover FBI agent Joseph Pistone, who was working under the alias Donny Brasco, to infiltrate the Bonanno crime family. Napolitano had allegedly even proposed Donny Brasco for membership into Cosa Nostra. It is often reported that when Sonny Black's body was discovered, the authorities found that his hands had been cut off. The severing of hands was allegedly symbolic, as Sonny Black had shaken hands unknowingly with undercover agent Joe Pistone, aka Donny Brasco, when he let him grow close to him. However, the autopsy of Napolitano tells another story. According to the autopsy, Sonny Black's remains showed signs of severe decomposition, which included several of his fingers. There is also evidence that suggests that his fingers had been either eaten or chewed by animals after his body had been poorly disposed of. The press and the media got wind of the missing digits, and this was eventually spun into the gangland myth that Sonny Black Napolitano had had his hands cut off. Interestingly, some sources state that Dominic Napolitano was not killed because of the Donny Brasco affair, but due to a power play orchestrated by Joseph Messino, who viewed Sonny Black as a threat. In 1972, Carlo Gambino's nephew, Manny Gambino, was murdered after allegedly being kidnapped and held for ransom. Following this, mob legend states that Carlo Gambino reached out to John Gotti to take revenge on James McBratney, one of the men allegedly responsible for the murder of Gambino's nephew Manny. And so, on May the 22nd, 1973, 
James McBratney was drinking in Snoop's Bar and Grill on Staten Island when he was approached by John Gotti, Angelo Vigero and Ralph Gallione. Some accounts state that they were posing as police officers looking to talk with McBratney. A struggle ensued and Ralph Ralphie Wiggs Gallione pumped three shots into McBratney, killing him. Many books, documentaries and movies, including the 1996 HBO movie Gotti, would have us believe that this killing was carried out as a result of a direct order from Carlo Gambino, a murder to avenge the death of his nephew Manny. However, James McBratney had nothing to do with the alleged kidnapping and murder of Manny Gambino. James McBratney was indeed associated with the kidnapping gang that had been targeting various Cosa Nostra members. Also in this kidnapping gang was McBratney's close friend, Crazy Eddie Maloney. Other members of the kidnapping gang alongside James McBratney and Eddie Maloney included the likes of Thomas Genovese and Warren Sherman, amongst several others. One of the mobsters that the gang kidnapped was Lucchese mobster Francesco Frankie the Wop Manzo. The gang received a $100,000 ransom paid by Lucchese family boss Carmine Tramonti. Following this, the gang carried out several more successful kidnappings, targeting mobsters across the various Cosa Nostra families in New York. But Carlo Gambino's nephew, Manny Gambino, was not one of the men that that gang targeted. When one of Eddie Maloney's associates tipped off the identities of the kidnapping gang to the mob, Eddie Maloney told McBratney to get out of town. But he wouldn't leave his family. Eddie Maloney himself was heading back to the relative safety of prison. As we know, James McBratney's decision to stay in the area had fatal consequences. So, while it is true that John Gotti was ordered to take out James McBratney, it had nothing to do with taking revenge for the kidnapping of Carlo Gambino's nephew. Manny Gambino was killed by Henry Robert Sentner, no relation to Lucchese mobster Anthony Sentner. Similar names, but different spelling. The circumstances around Manny Gambino's death had absolutely nothing to do with James McBratney and that kidnapping gang. And those involved in Manny's murder were actually sentenced in a court of law, as I've covered in a previous video. A lot of Mafia history books and documentaries often state that the hit team that killed Mafia boss Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria consisted of Joe Adonis, Bugsy Siegel, Vito Genovese and Albert Anastasia. However, most credible mob historians have debunked these individuals as being the shooters in the famous hit, as I've covered in a previous video. And in fact, Albert Anastasia had a solid legal alibi for his whereabouts at the time of Joe the Boss Masseria's killing. Research conducted by mob historian Tom Jones revealed that at midday on the day that Masseria was gunned down, Albert Anastasia walked into the office of attorney Samuel S. Leibovitz. In 1931, Samuel Leibovitz was a young attorney who was earning a reputation as a good defence lawyer. Leibovitz would go on to have a distinguished career and would eventually become a highly respected Brooklyn Kings County Court judge who sentenced multiple mobsters. Upon arrival at Leibovitz's office, Albert Anastasia made a point of asking the receptionist the time, which she duly obliged by consulting the office clock. Anastasia was then advised that Samuel Leibovitz was in court and would not be back for a while. Anastasia then took a seat and said that he was happy to wait until Leibovitz returned, which was a couple of hours later and Leibovitz was allegedly with Albert Anastasia at the time of Masseria's shooting. As mentioned, I've covered some of the various theories around who actually carried out the hit on Joe the Boss in a previous video. Anyway, just a quick one today. I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.